Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Yale. Uh, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director for the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. And this is the first uh, environmental marketing symposium um, hosted between the School of Management and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies here. Uh, both Dean Snyder at the School of Management and Dean Crane uh, really like to welcome the audience both here and online. Apologies to our audience online. We're starting a little bit late, but hello, everyone. Um, this. Um, I got a few people to thank uh, before we begin. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of speakers today. Uh, but first, uh, this is a component of the Sabin uh, Sustainable Venture Prize. Uh, the Sustainable Venture Prize is a $25,000 winner-take-all prize for the best for-profit venture that comes out of Yale University that supports a more sustainable way of life. Um, and our competition is being held next Thursday. Uh, we have some of the uh, competitors actually in the room today who will be in the final. Uh, we're really looking forward to it, and uh, this, this marketing workshop and symposium that has been organized uh, by a couple of folks who I'll get to in a second is a component of really hoping to help teach some of these early stage entrepreneurs the challenges that they have in, um, in marketing products that maybe the people haven't seen or are, don't fully understand. Um, so this is uh, hopefully an attempt to fill that. Um, Eric Plunkett, uh, Marissa Glesia. Uh, Marissa, in particular, this was really uh, her brainchild, and uh, she was the one who helped pull this together, bring it forward. Um, and before we get started, I'd just like to have a little round of applause for Marissa. Um, we also can't do anything at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment without Amy Badner, who is our event coordinator and basically makes everything happen here and puts it all together. Amy um, at, typically is not in the room right now, but is running around doing something else. Um, so if you see her, please uh, introduce yourself, say hello, um, and thank her for all her work. I'd appreciate that. Um, and finally, we never really are successful at doing anything uh, at both the School of Forestry and the School of Management without the involvement of our alumni. Uh, and Erica Diamond uh, was really um, someone who we reached out to quite early in the process to figure out how to pull this together. And she was able to tap into her network, um, pull us into you know, conversations with people that we wouldn't normally be able to talk to. And so we really thank Erica for helping to generate enthusiasm and interest amongst the students and faculty and administration here in this really timely and important topic as well. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce Marissa, who's going to be our MC for today's event. Marissa is a first year uh, joint degree student uh, between the School of Management and the School of Forestry, and as I mentioned, one of the key research assistants who's helped been working with us on initiatives this year. So, Marissa. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming. Uh, for our first presentation, we actually have two speakers. Um, the first is May Shibata, the Chief Strategy Officer at Think Eco, which is a leading provider of cloud-based energy efficiency and demand response solutions and the maker of cutting-edge energy savings products like the Modlet. Um, and then we also have Seth Bauer, um, who was not on any of our publications or invitations, but um, has surprised us today. And we are very excited to have him. Um, Seth is the Vice President of Brand Growth at Top 10, which is the leading source of independent information on energy efficiency of common products. And um, Seth and May will be uh, giving a presentation today on customer interest and willingness to pay, identifying the right customers for energy efficiency. Um, so with that, May and Seth, thank you very much. Thanks, Marissa. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is May Shabat. I'm one of the co-founders of Think Eco. Um, I'm also their current uh, chief strategy officer. Uh, before Think Eco, I was the head of strategy at a large ad agency called um, Euro RSCG in New York. So while I can talk generally about marketing, I felt that maybe today's focus should be more about our case study, kind of show you what we did and didn't do, what worked, what didn't work. So you know, I want this to be a fairly open forum. Um, and. Uh, Basically, I'm going to tell you uh, how we went about things and stumbled and all the lessons learned. 
Okay, so before I get started, um, I do want to explain to you just briefly what our technology is about because I think it's an important context. So um, we have what is an end-to-end -end platform. So we've got hardware on one end, we've got a software platform on the other, and it's basically an energy management system for plug loads. So anything that is plugged into an outlet. So what you have is what's called the modlet, a modern outlet. It plugs into an outlet, it meters your energy use, and you can actually set schedules to save on that energy use. So if you're not using something, why don't you shut down power to it? You could also control it remotely from your iPhone, for example, so that you know if you want to come home to a cool apartment, you may want to pre-cool your house, you know, turn on the window air conditioner, for example. So this is the simplest application of it. You know, it's definitely a consumer-oriented product in that you could use it in your home. But because outlets are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, you could use it in a commercial environment, you could use it anywhere you want. So this is um, our platform. Uh, it's patented. And uh, the reason why we focus on plug loads is it's actually the largest and fastest growing source of energy drain in both homes and offices across America. And if uh, you look at this chart here, what we're looking at is um, commercial office space is growing at 1% per year, okay, on a per square foot basis. And lighting has become more efficient. HVACs have become more efficient. Everything else has become so much more efficient, so they're actually decreasing on a port per square foot basis um, for energy consumption, but all the plug loads are the ones where, you know, we've got a lot more computers, a lot more stuff around, and so it's growing. And uh, this is important context for what we do in terms of marketing because this is not common knowledge. Right? People think, oh, I use a lot of electricity, a lot of energy in heating and cooling, um, the HVAC system, lighting. Yes, those were big problems in the past, but right now, actually, plug loads are the bigger problem, okay? So when we started out, um, our company is four years old. Uh, we um, realized that because outlets are everywhere, we could target residential, commercial spaces, as well as the utilities that provide the electricity to both of those venues. We felt, as consumers at heart, that... Uh, the residential environment would be the best target for our solution because it is consumer friendly. We felt then that the commercial environment would be a second good place because of the slide that I just showed you before where you know plug load energy use really is increasing on a per square foot basis. We felt lastly that maybe the utilities would be a, a good place to go last and that uh, you know there are larger entities, they're more difficult to work with in terms of figuring out who within the entity would, would be the right person to work with. So this was our hypothesis going into uh, the whole experience when we started out the company and we'll build, we built our first platform. It turns out when we uh, started commercializing and learning about the marketplace that we went about it in a slightly different order. Even though we wanted to do a consumer-oriented product, we, f we, we realized that as a small company it was cost prohibitive to do so. So we tabled that. Instead, we went for our second best option, the commercial space. And we targeted them, and uh, that was the first market we went for. Um, and then I'll tell you why we ended up at the in the utilities next. So starting with the commercial space. The platform that we have, the model platform, it's easily scaled to any environment. And because the whole software side is cloud-based, it resides nicely on a corporate network. So you could have different offices in different locations all supported by a single network. So this is the, really the, the pitch, if you will, that we you know, brought to companies, which is it's a nice retrofit solution. You could put it in this office, next office, the entire United States if you wanted to. You've got five offices, and all of this is going to be networked, and you're going to be able to manage your energy use on plug loads. We had some great data as well. So this is... Um, uh, these are all plug loads, so you can see the actual devices here. This is one section of one floor of an office. And what you're looking at is data from midnight to midnight uh, and power and watts on the y-axis. So what you're seeing is that the green zones on either end, this is when the office space is empty, okay? And there's still that much en energy use going on. So that, what, like 800, 900 watts? You know, that's like 70% of the peak daytime use. In other words, you're wasting all this energy at night. So for us, this was a fantastic proof point to our client base that, you know, the, this is real energy that you could be saving each night, you know, after everybody goes home, and also on the weekends and federal holidays when nobody is in the office. So scalable solution, great savings value proposition. So with that, um, 
we did a couple of uh, you know important things to really validate this value proposition to our target audience, which are the the, the businesses. So we went crazy and we did a hundred pilots in a hundred days. Um, this was I want to say maybe two and a half years ago, where we literally targeted. We're based in New York City, so we targeted a lot of the Fortune 500 companies there. Anybody who said anything about sustainability, about anything green, we went to them and said, you know, we've got a product. We want you to give it a try. Uh, you know, we will, you know, measure your electricity use. We'll do the savings. We're going to come up with a report at the end. We'll share the report with you. We're just going to go and do this. You know, would you provide your feedback? And we managed to get 100 companies to sign up, and we did this in 100 days. So that resulted in a report by us. Um, we called it the Eco Empowered Report, but we saw a lot of savings across different types of devices, across different organizations. Um, and it was very powerful from you know, sort of a, a savings validation standpoint. The technology works, it actually does what it's supposed to do, and so forth. What then we did was um, we did a joint small business study with NYSERDA. I don't know if you guys are familiar with NYSERDA, but they are the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. They provide a lot of grants uh, in energy efficiency to develop technologies, to market test technologies. So this was more of a market testing grant, if you will. And the idea here was that uh, you know, we targeted the large companies in the 100-unit uh, the pilot, but this is also a solution that you can do in a do-it-yourself kind of way, right? So it would be perfect for small business that you know, sublets a space, that you know, occupies a small corner of a large office space where they can't touch anything else. Plug loads are the only thing that uh, they can actually do energy efficiency on. So that was the, uh, the whole premise there. And we did a study with NYSERDA. We were able to show, again, significant savings. We were also able to show engagement. So now we were in an office space where you know, they, there may only be 12 people. So everybody knew what was going on. And when people knew what was going on, they saw the model. They said, huh, what is this? They saw the savings, and they became you know, a lot more engaged. And we saw that the savings were higher when people were engaged. So that was a nice lesson that we learned there. And so we took that a little bit farther and said, what if we just use this for employee engagement? Because people seem to be really excited about this. And you know, in corporate America, employee engagement is a very important part of you know, uh, employee retention, loyalty, and so forth. So we did this with a company called Grife. They're based out in Ohio. And uh, we basically had the models distributed to employees where they would set it up, they would test, they would um, use it in their cubicles, they would compete on the basis of savings and the person who saved the most amount of energy actually got a, uh, like a little trophy at the end. So um, we did that initiative, and it, went, and it went over extremely well. Okay, So we basically did everything from the savings validation side of the story to literally just you know, behavioral employee engagement type stuff. And uh, you know, we did this over a year and a half. You know, this was a big part of what we were working on. And these were the lessons that we learned you know, from a marketing standpoint. Um, even though it was easy to get 100 companies to pilot test with us, you know, pilot testing is not the same as purchasing, right? So when it actually came to the purchasing stage, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder purchase process, right? You've got facilities involved because it you know, takes up the, the actual physical space. You've got sustainability involved because you know, this is about a sustainability initiative. And you have IT involved because we have a software platform. So all of a sudden, you know, all three parties needed to sign off, which happened in some cases, and in other cases, their interests weren't aligned, so it became a really, really long sales cycle. Unfortunately, if when you look at any of these people, um, plug load energy management is not top of anybody's list. It's, it's a nice to have, you know, it's certainly gonna save you real money, and it's gonna get you measurable savings from a sustainability standpoint, because plug loads are such a big, you know, energy drain. But from a facility standpoint, you know, they're concerned about replacing the, the carpeting if that's what's broken, right? From a sustainability standpoint, you know, they're looking for that big headline that they can get out into the marketplace. And IT, it's all about security, right? Why add something that's gonna uh, get in the way of security? So when you think about it from that st standpoint of letting somebody do their job and doing it well, we hit those hurdles in the commercial space. Customer readiness also varied greatly. Uh, the people, or I'm sorry, the organizations that were most receptive to what we had to offer were those that had already taken measures. So they had taken measures to improve their lighting, they had taken measures to improve their HVAC system, and what they realized upon doing that was they did not get the energy efficiency gains that they thought they were gonna get. They fell short. And so they said, what is going on? So these were the people who had done their own research and realized 
you know what, we underestimated how much plug loads actually contribute towards the en energy use in our building. And those were the companies that we didn't have to educate them, they were already there, and the stakeholders were already on board because they had gone through a similar process with um, some of the other energy efficiency measures. So at the end of the day, what, where we are as an organization is we do have some large clients and we have some partners. So one of the ones that we um, uh, announced recently was our partnership with Accenture, which you know, is a business service provider in a lot of large uh, companies. And all of this makes sense because of the customer readiness being you know, all over the map. If you've got a, a partner like Accenture in there who already know who's ready, that helps us identify them. And um, it was something that you know, upon going through this entire exercise for like one and a half to two years, we realized that yes, there is opportunity in the commercial space. It's an early market and it's very much a targeted market where it, you know, for a small company like us, it does not warrant the resources to just kind of blanket everybody, right? And even if you try to target by size of company, type of company, you've got the internal dynamics that we don't, we're just not aware of until we get there. So for us, our strategy was, was uh, to basically partner with somebody who's already always there who could filter it for us. So that's where we've ended up on the, in the commercial side. So now I'm going to talk about utilities. So this is a completely different market. And uh, as I said in uh, one of the opening slides, this was for us our target number three of the three markets we thought we were going for because it seems complicated. I do not have a utility background and nobody at our company did at the time when we were getting started. But something funny happened here and, and uh, you know, this, this ended up being our success story. So what we have is a platform that saves energy from anywhere on anything that can be plugged into an outlet, right? From that standpoint, it's ubiquitous. But when we spoke to Con Edison, which is the New York City utility, um, they had a killer application for this. We were not aware of it. So in New York, there are 6.3 million window air conditioners. These are the air conditioners that hang outside windows. Yeah, you've seen them, right? Uh, I'm sure you guys have some of them here as well. And uh, yeah, 6.3 million, it contributes 20% of summertime electricity demand in New York. It's huge. It overshadows central AC systems by like four to five fold. So it's the biggest single problem they have. And uh, if any of you have installed a window air conditioner, you know once it goes in, it ain't coming out until it's broken, right? So these things are power hogs, they're old, uh, and there's no way to control them unless the consumer is there to turn it on and off themselves. So they looked at our platform and said, well, why can we, can we use this for window air conditioners? We would love the, t the control to be temperature based and we would love to be able to trigger it when there's a peak electricity demand uh, day, you know, during the summertime. So we worked with Con Edison through an R&D partnership where we not only enable the on off of the window air conditioner, but do so with temperature control, so we added a little bit to our technology platform. And the reason why Con Edison partnered with us is um, not only was the technology platform that we already had complementary to what they wanted, but they saw this as a great marketing opportunity because we had something that was so consumer friendly. So our gut instinct going into this company and starting out with a very with very much of a consumer friendly mindset actually helped us to secure this utility deal because they didn't want to do anything that seemed industrial grade, right? They wanted something that consumers would want to adopt on their own. So what we provided to the consumer was the ability to remotely control their window air conditioner from their smartphone, right? So if you forgot to turn off your air conditioner as you left your house, you could do it from your smartphone and you could save energy by doing that. Or as I said in the earlier example, you could pre-cool your home 15 minutes before you come home. It's a great consumer benefit. And if you actually set schedules to you know, keep your air conditioner off while you're out of the house, you're gonna save real money. So that dual benefit, the real benefit to the utility to be able to reduce peak demand and the benefit to the consumer of this being you know, something that they could really use was what uh, you know, helped this, this opportunity. So as you can see, when we actually rolled it out into the market space, um, we launched this three years ago. So now we're in year three. We uh, definitely took on a very consumer-friendly uh, feel to the whole thing. We branded it Cool NYC. We came up with a program name. So we said, okay, you know, what we have is a technology, right? We, what we have is a product, actually, as far as the consumer is concerned. 
But if you're going to try to get people to sign up to help reduce electricity for the utility, it needs to be a program. It needs to be something that people belong to. It's not just about a product that they have. So we uh, called it Cool NYC. We trademarked it. We came up with a website. And as you can see on the web, uh, from the screenshot of the website here, we have all the value propositions right across the middle. It helps you stay connected. It helps you to cool in a much more smart kind of way. And it lets you check in from anywhere in terms of energy use and in terms of uh, how you're using your air conditioners. We rolled this out through retail as well. So, um, you know, our customer is Con Edison. So they pay, help to pay for the product and to offset costs. But we wanted to get it into people's hands in a way that was natural to them. And we felt the best way to do that was to do it through retail. So we offered it through retail at Best Buy, at eight Best Buy stores in New York City, where uh, people could buy it for $69.99. The moment they sign up online, they would get a $25 uh, e-gift card, so it would incentivize them to do that. They would use this product all summer long. And at the end of the summer, they would get another $25 back. So we created this, this ecosystem where we had a retail partner, you know, we had a program in place, and uh, we also had people sign up on their own. So um, in certain targeted neighborhoods, we really wanted people to, you know, to, to use the products. So we um, you know, did recruitment events at green markets and other places where you know, we could get into the local communities. And as you can see from the, uh, the growth here in, in, in terms of people signing up and using the product, you know, we had a really successful summer. And when we talked to people at the beginning, when they you know, first got the product, uh, the values that they were talking about were preventing blackouts, making it easier to use electricity, and making a difference. So, you know, they were motivated by uh, a desire to, um, to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, that was interesting for us to see. So, having done all of this, you know, we got a program in place, we got people signed up, we got people to purchase, we got people basically using the product. The ultimate value to Con Edison is that we got a uh, load that we can now control. So what you're looking at, the histogram on the left-hand side, shows the load curve of all the units that we have under management. And as you can see, you know, the average is about 1,000 watts. So you know, there's, that, there's significant room to actually curtail use during a hot summer day. And what you're looking at on the right-hand side is when we actually did an event where it's a call to conservation event, but we basically ask, we, you know, have people shut off their ACs for a short period of time or, or change the set temperature. And what you see is the difference between the baseline of where the energy use would have been to what was actually used. So this helps to keep the grid more reliable on a really hot day. An interesting thing that happened along the way is, you know, as I said, you know, when people first sign up, it was all about um, you know, helping kind of us and doing the right thing and so forth. Uh, we asked them at the end of the summer um, what they actually did. And it turns out people seem to have gotten a lot more out of it. Okay, so 18% said that they told their friends to save energy as a result of using the model and seeing how much energy their uh, window air conditioners use. 22% said they use their lights less because they became more aware, you know, the correlation between energy use and dollar, you know, spent on electricity. 52% said they use their AC less after seeing its energy use. Not surprising. 60% said that they now turn off or unplug their unused devices. So, you know, they kind of thought about other electronics. You know, what else is using electricity in my home? And 90% want to re-enroll in Cologne MyC again next year, which is actually now, this year. Okay, so an interesting thing happened here where, you know, the consumer was not aware of this product. Uh, it was introduced to them through Con Edison, through the Cool NYC program that we had put into place. We basically lowered the hurdle for adoption for people. But once they started using it, we saw all the effects that we thought we would see amongst the consumer base. So the lessons learned here is that, uh, you know, from uh, who is the right target audience, who is the right purchaser, the fact that there was a killer application for these window air conditioners in New York City really enabled this utility partnership to take hold a lot faster than we would have otherwise expected. And, you know, I think it's, it's true to say that this is a partnership. Yes, Con Edison is our customer, but, you know, we work with them on so many levels that, you know, we, we do treat each other as partners, and I think that was key, that uh, in order to get, you know, a utility to actually buy into something like this, that we actually provide value on a level of a partner. The dual benefit, you know, as I alluded to earlier, the fact that we actually do demand reduction for utilities and provide a consumer benefit in terms of, you know, the remote controllability of your window air conditioners was key for adoption, obviously. 
And uh, you know, I, I believe that our success was just as much about as, as, as marketing as it was about technology, right? The fact that it was a fun program to be a part of and they got a product that you know, lived up to its promise, if you will. So that consistency, the, the, the trust, was something that we believe you know, really made a difference. So for us, you know, as we kind of journeyed through targeting commercial customers and uh, ending up working with utilities, by far you know, working with utilities was the right, right target audience for us. But now that we've had some success with consumers, you know, having done a, a Cool NYC, we obviously want to do more, right? So um, now we are retail available. We're available at uh, Best Buy, Walmart, Amazon, and a couple of local chains. And uh, what you see here is, you know, an ad that you know you might see on your uh, on a website uh, if you were looking for something, some sort of energy saving product. So. Um, yeah, we've been retail available for a little over a year at Best Buy and, you know, really Amazon and Walmart, like literally over the last like three to four months. Okay, so this is brand new for us. What we have in our favor is we get, we have great media buzz. We have been in hundreds of publications, uh, mass media over the last couple of years. We've been on national TV about 10 times. Um, you know, last year we were on CNN Money during the summer, you know, New York One, sort of, you know, we do manage to get the word out, which is fantastic for a company our size. And, you know, if you're trying to do consumer marketing, all of that stuff is important. Now, as I said, we're early in this market. And uh, in terms of our lessons learned, uh, media mentions do drive sales. We definitely see a blip, but it's a short-lived blip, Okay. Um, awareness is clustered geographically. We get a lot of sales in New York, a lot in California. Uh, you know, there, there are definitely pockets where you might expect energy efficiency products to take off, and we're certainly seeing traction there. Um, we're also seeing a lot of nothingness in a lot of the other parts of the United States. So for us, you know, it's been a real question how to scale this cost effectively, if at all, and this is the reason why um, you know, we brought Seth Bauer along uh, for this part of the presentation because you know, from our standpoint as a single organization, we feel that you know, we've seen it through Cool NYC. If consumers actually give it a try and use it, they get the full value out of it. They're more likely to tell their friends and it, you know, we hope that it sort of snowballs. But to just get onesies and twosies sale you know, to consumers, we're not quite sure that, you know, how we're going to get there. So I think at this point I want to bring Seth up and, uh, you know, he's got a lot more experience uh, in the consumer retail space. Thank you. Hi, I'm Seth Bauer from Top 10 USA. Um, I am clearly a terrible marketer because I didn't even manage to get Marissa to understand that I was coming and talking here today. So uh, I wouldn't actually listen to anything I say over the next few minutes. Um, top 10 is kind of a uh, consumer reports for energy efficiency. And uh, so, so we look at products from an energy efficiency standpoint, and we try to introduce that into the consumer conversation, the consumer mindset, the consumer decision, and then see if we can get manufacturers to compete, to innovate, uh, to be ever more efficient by recognizing, by creating basically top 10 lists of the most efficient whatevers. Um, but getting energy efficiency into the conversation is no easy task. And I'm, I'm going to talk ab about this today from the perspective of a shopping journey. So how you as a consumer uh, think about, go about buying products and um, where you know, energy efficiency might or might not become part of that equation. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about 
consumers and green decisions, uh, and I come out of the media world. I, uh, for a long time, was a magazine editor, including uh, head of a group at National Geographic called The Green Guide, which was really the first attempt by National Geographic to move from uh, offering inspiration to care about the environment to offering practical advice about how to live in the environment. Um, and so, you know, every cover line on a magazine is a marketing decision. Uh, and we think about them very carefully. We test them. We play with them. Uh, we get feedback after the fact. Um, and so every little bit of wording about how to think in a green way, why, what's going to motivate you, why you might care, um, is reflected in, in a magazine cover. And so you look at things, you know, words like, first of all, you look at numbers. You always try to get numbers on a magazine cover because for some reason people like lists, which I now relate to my top 10 work. You look at uh, what the personal payoff is. Um, you look at cooling your home with less energy. May I should have uh, shown you that one earlier. Uh, you look at being safer. Uh, you look at what the, the personal payoff is for someone, and that's true in any marketing context. So now I'm going to talk about what the modern shopping journey is like, and it is, uh, it's changed. It's, ch it's changing rapidly, and it really is a journey uh, of inputs, expectations, what you care about, and then what you get out of it. So imagine that your refrigerator is broken, and, and I, I found this awesome 1970s refrigerator, uh, and I had one of those first in my house and then in my garage for a long, long time. And once you learn anything about energy efficiency, one of the things you learn is having a refrigerator in your garage, especially an old, tired one, is about the stupidest thing you can do. So your refrigerator's broken, uh, but Shoppers are no longer shoppers. You no longer just go into a store and say, okay, I want to replace a refrigerator. You are a multi-channel consumer nowadays. And every uh, big consulting firm on earth is looking at retail from the perspective of multi-channel. So if you're going to learn anything about retail, start with the code word multi-channel. So this is from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, when I was pulling this together, I saw reports from McKinsey, from Forrester, from uh, basically everybody you can think of looking at the multi-channel shopping experience. And what, what multi-channel means is that you are going to combine your social networking life, your online or connected life, and uh, your time shopping, uh, you know, your, your time in actual brick and mortar stores, and you're going to use it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, so I want to buy my new uh, refrigerator, and maybe the first thing I'm going to do is call my friend May Shibata, who has, uh, and I was going to surprise her with this slide, and then I sent her my deck last night, so she, she was on to this, but maybe I'm going to call May and ask her um, what she knows about refrigerators, because I know May is a very intelligent person, and I know she works in the energy efficiency space, and maybe she's actually going to know something about that. And if she doesn't, her daughter probably is, because she's really smart. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm going to go online, and I'm going to post something to my hundreds of Facebook friends to see if any of them have learned anything about refrigerators lately, You know, know something that I don't. Uh, and, and actually, I, I just tried this. I tried to sort of crowdsource information recently. I'm, I'm taking a business trip next week to Beijing, and I haven't been there before. And so I posted something on Facebook. Um, and you know, I figure among my many friends, I'm sure a lot of them have traveled over there before. And I got like four snarky comments and absolutely no useful advice whatsoever. So. I'm now getting a little dubious, but I might post something on Facebook saying, do you know anything about refrigerators? And then while I'm there, I'm going to look and notice that my college roommate had posted a graduation picture from the 
early 80s on the Yale campus, and that fuzzy person on the right with the fuzzy hair is me. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, is look electronically. Um, and among these various studies by these big consulting firms, just enormous numbers of consumers include online research now as part of their buying decision. So 88% say they research via their PC. Although one thing that's interesting about that is even in this uh, you know, smartphone and tablet happy society, the, the numbers around doing product research are still concentrated on the, on the PC, on the laptop or the desktop. Um, and maybe it's because the screens are too small or the, the connection's not as fast or something, but people aren't actually going to Google very often and trying to do product research on their phones yet. Um, so okay, now I'm, now I'm in this electronic world. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to a retail site. I'm going to see what Sears has. Uh, but then I start worrying about, you know, is this the right decision? So I'm going to go back to Google, and I'm going to search for um, some kind of third-party validation for the decision I'm considering making. And again, there's a lot of research that says consumers who, sh who research online, research on retail sites, and then also look for independent validation for their decisions. And that's really, that, you know, that's my current business. That's what top 10 is all about. So I type in refrigerator rankings, and I get a list of things. Consumer Reports, not surprisingly, comes up first. J.D. Power comes up second. But uh, thank God, somewhere on this first page, uh, is top 10 USA, and it has the words energy efficient large refrigerators. And that is the first time, so if you looked at the SEER site, if you looked on Facebook, if you uh, called May Shibata, uh, uh, that, that one may, may or may not be true, she probably would talk about energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency has not been part of the conversation yet. And this is the moment really when it gets introduced. And this is what I am focusing on as a way to um, start to create that consumer demand for truly efficient products, because we just waste so much for, so, for no reason. I mean, most of the energy that we waste, we waste uh, because we don't think about it, basically probably because it's too inexpensive to care about. You know, you're only paying, whatever, 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so we introduce energy efficient into the conversation. And you click on that, and you, you have what I hope is a really easy to use, robust website that just tells you what the 10 most efficient products are in all of these various product categories. But the message to consumers is not necessarily save, buy this product and save energy. And if you think about your consumer experience, um, we buy things for all kinds of reasons and we get all kinds of rewards from buying products. We get the, we get the utilization of the product, um, but we also get status, we get, there's a little, you know, some chemical, biochemical mix that happens when you buy something, you get a little jolt of, of whatever it is, happy juices, when you buy something. Uh, it, the consumer experience is, is uh, a, an emotional and visceral experience, and the consumer reward is beyond, oh, I'm going to save a few pennies on my energy bill. So, so there has to be a message that is, beyond the dry message of efficiency and into the message of this is exciting. So, so I'm, um, I'm on a one-man campaign. So far, it's one-man campaign uh, with the LED lighting industry to start a, a Got Milk-style advertising campaign where uh, LED lighting is really its superior light. I mean, there's a reason 
why museums are using it to light their paintings. And there's a reason why Martha Stewart uses it, and I used to work for Martha, so I know this, uh, you, you know, uses it in her offices and is starting to use them in her home. Um, and so I want to say not those expensive little LEDs are more efficient, you should buy them. I want to say this is the light of the future. And if you don't have this, you're, you know, you're behind the times. You can put yourself in the best light. You can see your, your kitchen counter in museum quality light. And I have some interest from the LED side, but also from the um, utility world in maybe creating a, a big campaign around this. So that's one message to consumers. Another message is co to consumers is, um, you know, be smart. You know, it, like, we, we often talk about, um, we talk about energy consumption as sort of an evil in and of itself. And really, for most of us, it's not. You know, environmentalists talk about it as an evil in and of itself. But for most of us, energy efficiency is, you know, it's a, it's a lesser form of motivation, lesser form of interest. But we all hate waste. We all hate wasting things. And an environmentalist hates wasting things. A, you know, climate change non-believer hates wasting things. If you frame the, uh, uh, the proposition in a more universal way, and you actually say, you know, you have a little fun with it, um, there's an opportunity to actually get consumers engaged. So I actually did, I, I did, and I was gonna, if this were more of a classroom, I was gonna ask you guys to brainstorm. I, I have done a top 10 list, and I, I don't pretend to be uh, David Letterman writer, but I sort of took advantage of the fact that he does these top 10 lists all the time and said, okay, what are the top 10 reasons uh, to choose energy efficient products? Um, and I tried, I tried to be humorous. I didn't try to be funny, but I think it would be a worthy exercise to try to be funny. I think there could be a really good list here. So anyone who wants to take on that assignment, just email me because everybody's a closet David Letterman writer, I know that. Uh, so, so back to your consumer shopping experience. So you, you're on the, our site and you can drill down very quickly to what the top products are. Uh, you can price them. You can see if they are available at brick and mortar stores near you. You can see if your utility is offering uh, a rebate we want to, we're not spending a lot of time selling energy efficiency. We want to get you to make a consumer purchasing decision as seamlessly as possible for the right reason, because if it's on our site, it's an energy efficient product. So then what are you going to do? You're going to actually uh, consider going to stores. And this is a huge phenomenon, and it cuts both ways, where consumers um, will research online, but they still want to go have the in-store experience. They want to see things, you know, see the actual product before they buy it. So they, they research online, but they don't buy online. And so if you look at big statistics about, you know, consumer uh, online retail, online retail is still less than 20% or something of total retail. And online retail for things like appliances is about 7 or 8 percent. So there aren't big inroads there. There is still an actual store involved, although uh, what these consulting firms are saying is there might not be stores in the way that we know stores now for very long, where we expect to go in and they have the product in stock and um, we take it, you know, we put it in the back of our car and, and bring it home. Uh, the prediction is that stores are going to be much more showrooms where you can play with things, so, so more kind of the Apple Store model where, you, you know, you can play, you can look, but uh, where you actually buy it and how it's delivered may not be very directly related to um, 
that store experience. All right, so you bring home your refrigerator and it still looks like a 1970s model, but now it's very 2013 because you're actually wearing a glass globe on your head. This was, a, this was an ad from the early 70s about sort of the, the kitchen of the future, and I'm not sure why women are supposed to wear fishbowls now, but apparently here in the future, we should all be wearing fishbowls on our head. And hopefully, oh, and there's earrings too. I don't know what those earrings do. They're really cool though. But hopefully lots of people are going to do this. Um, and lots of people are going to elevate energy efficiency to the top. And lots of people are going to have top 10 super efficient um, models of appliances. Um, and why? And that then uh, this guy on the right is the president of Bosch, um, who I've met with a couple of times. And then he's going to be really excited about making the next top 10 list. Um, and if you look at, uh, I'm going to make you as hyper aware of this as I am now, which I apologize for in advance. Um, as you're looking at consumer ads in various media, look at how many of them mention uh, a J.D. Power award. There are J.D. Power award winners for cars, for insurance companies, for products. Um, consumers have no idea, I don't think, who J.D. Power is. is it, do people in this room know what J.D. Power is as an entity or what they do? Um, you don't need to. You trust. You, you've heard it before and you trust that this is a big deal or the manufacturer wouldn't be crowing about it or the insurance company wouldn't be crowing about it. That's where we're trying to get top 10. And we want this guy on the right to um, actively be saying, OK, what can we build that is going to put us on next year's top 10 list? How can we improve the efficiency of our refrigerator so that we're on that list? And here's why it matters. The fact is. Um, I'm going to go forward one and then come back. <laughs> the fact is, this is pretty much the only indication that most consumers have about any form of energy efficiency. Does it have that turquoise Energy Star label? And what Energy Star, Energy Star is a government program. It's uh, run through the EPA currently. Um, and it sets minimum standards for higher efficiency products. And any products that meet its baselines can carry that Energy Star tag. Um, what Energy Star hasn't really gone out of the way to publicize, nor has any of the manufacturers, because it's really not in their interest, is there is a huge margin between something that just meets that Energy Star baseline and something that is Identical size, often from similar manufacturers, similarly priced, um, uh, similarly featured, but is at the top of the efficiency curve. So this is a chart showing the difference between a standard suite of products, a television, a computer, a dishwasher, clothes washer, refrigerator, and a, uh, that, that just barely meet the Energy Star qualifications. And uh, the same products from the same level of manufacturers. And, and one of the things that we do at Top 10 is we have a, um, an is this product actually for sale in the marketplace uh, test. Because a lot of times uh, you'll see a list of super efficient products and you go to buy one and they are nowhere to be found. They're discontinued. They're back ordered. They're uh, they're only sold in Canada. I mean, there are all kinds of there are 20 reasons why you know a government Energy Star list only has about 40 percent of the products that are actually available. So we screen for that. Um, so you can save you know just through your everyday consumer choices, you can save. 
you know, almost half the electricity you're using now on your most commonly used uh, electric goods. Um, if anybody in this room knew that besides me, uh, you know, walking in here, I would be amazed. Uh, and that's what really, you know, that's what top 10 is here to do. Back at that Google page, we want to introduce energy efficiency into the conversation so that, and get you excited about it by pointing out that it's stupid to waste electricity and that you can put yourself in the best light with the best choices um, to move you from that left-hand column to the right-hand column. So that is your new shopping journey uh, involving all kinds of places where energy efficiency can get introduced into the conversation. And I think probably as, as we turn this over to later speakers, you'll see how some people are trying to reinforce that message from other perspectives. Thanks. for questions, so um, I guess me and um, Seth, if you want to stay up here, and um, Eric will come around and give you a microphone to uh, just say your name and where you're from before you answer, ask the question. Thanks. So actually, one thing that I uh, had written to Marissa in that email that she didn't get, so she didn't know I was here, um, is that I, uh, I grew up in New Haven, and I went to Yale as an undergrad, so this is kind of a homecoming for me, so thanks for... Thanks for giving me the time. <laughs> um, hi, May. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Aparna. I'm a second year graduate student here at the School of Forestry. Uh, so I have a couple of questions related though. Uh, what is the average deal size of your commercial customer? Uh, what is the average sales cycle? Um, you know, the sales cycle time. And also, did you benchmark uh, your adoption rates with other new um, energy saving technology companies? And how did you fare? The answer to the last question is no, we have not benchmarked. Um, in terms of average deal size, to if you're looking at a large commercial space with multiple floors, an entire building, for example, it's it's really easy to get to like a one floor deployment you know, everybody wants to test things, right? And, and, and businesses are no exception. So we can usually get to a full floor deployment in just a couple of meetings, really. You know, so depending upon do you meet them every week or every other week, you know, it sort of changes that. But really the, the, the hardest part of the adoption is then going to scale, right? So, you know, we've got one uh, big organization out in California where they've done a floor, they've done a building, now are they gonna do all 20 of their buildings? I mean, that is a multi-year process. Uh, we don't disclose average deal size. Thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, my name's Jeff Woodward. I'm a second year student, both in the School of Forestry and School of Management. Um, May, I'm curious about how you message the demand response component of your program to customers. Just because I think people, it just seems complicated. Like you're going to control my AC, you're not going to control my AC. H how did you get over some of those hurdles with folks? It is definitely hard. And, uh, you know, it does not come up in the first conversation because they're still trying to understand what it is that I can do with it, right? So in the first conversation, it's very much about you can control your window air conditioner from your smartphone, you know, or like you could save energy on your window air conditioner. Um, where the demand response comes up is um, we actually call it a conservation event, which I think just, you know, intuitively makes more sense to, to consumers. Um, so where the conservation event concept comes up is when people sign up to the program, they have to sign a form that says, I am participating in the program. The program consists of 
running a couple of conservation events. So that's where it gets introduced. So it's definitely part of the second conversation. It's within the context of a conservation event. And we message to people before the event. So 24 hours before an event, we say, tomorrow electricity use in New York City is going to be extremely high. We would like to set the temperature on your AC a couple of degrees higher. If you're OK with it, you don't need to do anything. If you're, if you're, you know, if you don't want to participate, go here to opt out. And then we do the same reminder again two hours prior. So we keep kind of messaging it so that they're at every moment in time there's absolutely no surprise about what's going on. And we make sure that people feel a part of it, right? So after an event is done, we then message people back and say thank you very much for your participation. We were able to reduce usage by X percent. And that way we kind of close the loop back again. Commercial energy users uh, who have on-site generation often have an agreement with their power suppliers for uh, interruptible power during peak periods. And that lowers their electric rate. It's a contractual rate for the year. Uh, is there any uh, inroads with Con Ed to introduce this system into the residential market for use with your product? In the residential? Sorry, to, to use a product in a residential environment for yeah, peak? Yeah, for your air conditioning interruption, would there be a benefit for the consumer if, you, if Con Ed were to restructure their electric rates, reduce them on an annual basis to allow them to interrupt the power to the air conditioner? Uh, not at this point. Um, everything that, you know, for example, Con Edison does with their customers has to go through the Public Service Commission process. So at this point, you know, this is a voluntary program where it's, you know, incentivized that way. To your point, though, about, uh, you know, in the commercial space, we have been looking into cycling different types of electronics to help people stay within, you know, a certain usage so that, you know, if you're a commercial client, you don't have such high demand charges, even if you're not structured under the type of scenario you're talking about. Actually, just a quick comment on that. There are some places in the country now where residential prices are uh, demand-based. They, they vary with demand. Um, with the, the Think Eco program and the modlets for the, for the AC system that you did with Con Ed there, did you have an average kilowatt hour savings per user that signed up for the program? Did you have that metric? And I'm curious, did you also calculate in the server usage of energy that's used to, to do the campaign? How much energy is it costing you to send out all these email reminders and the process of using these devices? Thank you. We have not quantified that. Um, I know that we've done it on a general level, you know, just having modlets out there. Um, and, you know, it's, it still saves significant energy despite all of that. We've also done a whole calculation in terms of, you know, the carbon that's used from the manufacturing to then how much is saved and so forth. Um, in terms of the energy saving through uh, the Cool NYC program, there are two types of savings. So number one is during the peak, right, the conservation events that we were talking about. The average demand reduction during uh, all the conservation events we've run is 25%. And that's across all air conditioners, whether they're actually on at the beginning of an event or, you know, they're just there, right? So um, that is a very significant uh, level of demand reduction. Again, if you're thinking about 6.3 million window air conditioners, you know, more than 1,000 watts each, that is, you know, if you could enroll even 10% of window air conditioners, you might be able to, you know, offload the capacity of like a medium-sized plant. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, savings there. In terms of um, consumer-driven savings, so these are people who set savings schedules so they keep their air conditioner off when in the past they would have left it on all day long. That varies all over the map uh, because, you know, some people put schedules in place, some people had already religiously turned things on and off. But we did note that uh, last summer, people saved anywhere from on the low end $60 during the summer to on the high end $1,400. So the range is huge. Uh, and as a result of the range being so large, uh, we actually do not message that. We don't want people to be, you know, disappointed by their savings if they're on the lower end of the average. We also don't want to, 
you know, if, if you know you've got a big air conditioner, you're going to think you're going to save more. And we don't want to disappoint those people either by showing them an average that's, you know, artificially low. So those are numbers that we ha have, but uh, we, f we feel that that's not going to be a motivating factor. to wrap up now, um, but I'm sure that May, Shivada, and Seth Bauer will both be around to follow up with any additional questions afterwards. Um, please join me in thanking them again for two really interesting uh, presentations on how Thanks. to promote energy efficiency. We really appreciate you coming. Um, now, just to try to get back on schedule, let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back in for a talk from Marta Kirsis of Recycle Bank. Thank you.
actually get started again, I also just wanted to thank a couple of students who have really helped me put all this together. Um, I could not have organized this conference without Catherine Wright, Natalie. Plunkett, so thank you all. And also thank you, Anthony Clark, for jumping in and helping us deal with these technical issues. Um, sorry we're a little bit continually behind schedule today, but um, you know, technology is what it is. So um, our next speaker is Marta Kiersis, the Vice President of Insights at Recycle Bank. Um, we had a slight change of plans at the last second, and though you may have seen that Kate Durkin would be here, um, we are very excited to have Marta in her place. Um, Recycle Bank gets people engaged on environmental issues from recycling to energy use by rewarding people for taking everyday green actions um, with discounts and deals from local and national businesses. It was one of Fast Company's 50 most innovative companies in uh, 2012. Marta oversees all market research-based initiatives for the company. She joined Recycle Bank in 2010 and leads the charge in understanding how to motivate behavior change among eco-curious mainstream consumers. Before joining Recycle Bank, Marta was Director of Digital Strategic Insights and Research for MTV Networks. In this role, she focused on interplay of technology, media, and advertising. She holds a Bachelor of Arts with Honors in Sociology and Anthropology from Colgate University. Marta? Hello, thanks for having me today. Apologize for the delay. We were hoping to have some video, um, and fingers crossed we may have it, uh, but we'll uh, continue on. Um, it's always a journey, and um, you know, it seemed to be a theme in the first presentation today, and um, continue to weave it out uh, in my presentation as well. But I would first like to start off with um, having everybody stand. Stretch those legs a little bit. <clears throat> All right. So please keep standing if you consider yourself to be a frequent recycler. So what I mean by that is that you're really diligent about making sure that you're sorting your recycling from your waste and getting it to the curb uh, whenever you can. Excellent. Not surprising. I thought I'd be in a room with uh, some pretty greenies. <clears throat> Keep standing if you um, regularly recycle the products that you use in your bathroom. So what I mean by that is when you finish using the shampoo bottles, the conditioner bottles, the soap bottles, you make sure to recycle those as well. Pretty good. Not surprising. Um, please keep standing uh, if you are diligent about recycling your batteries, your old cell phones, and <clears throat> or computers. Or you're like me, who I really, really want to. I have them in my drawer, but they're sitting there collecting dust because I'm just not quite sure how and when the right time to do it is. Excellent. And last, please keep standing if you've ever heard of Recycle Bank before today's symposium. <laughs> you can all sit down now. So give yourself an applause for a bit of participation. Thank you very much. Um, but ultimately, the goal of that exercise was really to show that we're all on a journey, um, and particularly as it relates to sustainable action and, and green actions. Um, and this journey is really what a theme that will weave itself through the presentation today, and I think seems to be an overarching theme that we will address today. So thank you for joining on that, on that journey. Um, so today, I'm here to focus on um, how we connect our online lives with our offline lives. But first, I really want to take a step back um, and talk about the genesis um, of the Recycle Bank idea. Um, you know, here today, we're talking about marketing, um, and particularly in the green space. And the basic marketing principle is really to think about uh, fulfilling a need or a desire, um, you know, looking whether it be from a utilitarian perspective or an emotional standpoint. And ultimately, where Recycle Bank uh, stemmed from was stu two students uh, in business school uh, in the early 2000s. And at the time, it was just after 9-11, and New York City was under a severe budget crisis. Uh, they were dealing with the aftermath of the towers falling. Uh, they were in uh, fiscal uh, constraints. And we started to take away many of the items or materials that we were recycling up until that date. 
And so it was a very much an emotional response to how could this happen, something that um, I have emotional connection to, um, that I think is doing something better for the world, is all of a sudden being taken away from me. And so they sought out to really help to solve this problem and dilemma. Now, every marketing uh, solution really should be founded in an insight. Um, and particularly with insight, it tends to be uh, very uh, backward or like, past facing, but really we need to turn the lens on that and, and uh, look at it from a forward facing perspective. And so what we do is we uh, begin to look at the market challenges and, and determine what the insight is from there uh, to figure out what is the real opportunity. We knew that there was this emotional uh, detachment that was happening um, that created this want and desire to figure out how to make recycling uh, more po possible to the masses, but really what was a marketplace challenge. And so we've done a bit of a deep dive into that. In the US, there is um, over 132 million household units, but only 50% of households actually have access to recycling. That's a huge, huge gap. And a part of that really stems from infrastructure. But when we took a deeper dive into the actual recycling habits, we're seeing that only 18% of materials that are able to be recycled are recyclable. And ultimately, we determined that this is where we wanted to put our focus. While we could start to think about infrastructure and work with, and work with governments to help to alleviate those problems, really, we wanted to be a consumer-facing uh, product in which to really help to understand and bring to the forefront and how to really get to motivate uh, change as it relates to sustainable behaviors. At the same time, when we thought about how do we increase recycling rates and how do we uh, look to motivate people to change everyday behavior, we wanted to take a cross look at consumer behavior in general. And so we ultimately were able to seize upon a mainstream uh, movement. So we took a cross section of just green attitudes and behaviors um, across the uh, US um, population. And this stems from actually a third party research uh, from BBMG. Um, and it takes a really cross look um, about the, essentially the journey that consumers are on as it relates to sustainable behaviors. And ultimately, what we came across and the insight that we pretty much are driving towards is really speaking to that 60% in the middle that are somewhere on their green journey. So we realize that there's about 30% of the population out there that will never, ever be, have any greenness in their mindset, in their attitudes, and their behaviors, and ultimately will never change uh, what they're actually wanting to do. As well as, there's about 15% of the um, of the audience out there, consumers out there, that are very, very dark green. I'm sure that many of you fall into this bucket. But where we really saw the ability to be able to create a mass change was in that 60%, in that middle. Um, and when we dive deeper, we want to really understand what were the hurdles among the 60% that really they didn't, why they weren't um, incorporating more green actions into their life. And ultimately, what we found, and the insight that we're, we're very much based upon, is 78% of consumers say they would do more if they understood how a particular green action can help the environment, as well as benefit them personally. To date, at, you know, as we led, as we led up to you know the early 2000s and, and into to the, and into the uh, 2000s, really many of the tactics that had been used were of a threatening nature. They were. Um, you know, you had uh, stats thrown at you that weren't easily digestible or understandable. Um, words that unless you were familiar with in the, in the industry or, you know, deeply embedded, you had no idea what they meant. And so it was a very scary, threatening place in which to start to tap, to tap into and, and, you know, put your toes into the water there. So what we have, you know, what we have done is turn that on its side and really thought about how do we make uh, the, the information that people are seeking both in a fun, easy, digestible manner, which is relatable, but also seamless into their lifestyles? So we fully acknowledge that environmental issues are not at the forefront of everyday person's life. One doesn't wake up and think about the impact, uh, you know, top of mind impact of the impact that they're having and the environment that, you know, on the environment. 
Really, what they're interested in is getting their kids out the door, making sure that they're fed, making sure that they can pay their bills. Um, and so, you know, the challenge that has been posed to us is really how do we make, how do we insert this dialogue seamlessly into their lives? So ultimately, Recycle Bank stands at the forefront of the interplay between green, technology, and social. We've come up with a very bold and aspirational mission statement, and ultimately I'll read it to you word for word. So we seek to motivate individuals and communities to realize a world where nothing is wasted. Now we understand that you know, this is very broad reaching and far reaching, but it, you know, it has two particular intersects in which we're both speaking to individuals as well as communities. And how do we play that in, out in the green space with all the evolutions and innovations that are happening in technology today? Ultimately, what Recycle Bank does, it rewards people for taking everyday green actions. So whether it be recycling, energy reduction, water conservation, uh, more greener uh, transportation options, and looking to have a personal recognition around that through our point system, as well as rewarding them with our, with our catalog of deals and discounts um, to help, you know, reward per, a person for taking those actions and really moving along down that, that path, that journey that they're taking to, be, uh, to lead greener lives. So ultimately, Recycle Bank is in a trifecta where we engage communities, we work with municipalities um, and community members in to um, bring the Recycle Bank program to uh, communities and engage them at a very local level. We partner with brands uh, and innovate uh, both, of, both our product, but as well as the marketing messaging and what, how to um, speak to consumers about sustainability um, through the lens that they're on a journey. And lastly, we look to motivate members, um, in which we motivate them through our platform, uh, through educational and incentive uh, programs. So here was supposed to be the first video, but I have a sense we didn't get it up running. So um, ultimately, I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into uh, what the value of communi communities have uh, with Recycle Bank. So ultimately, doesn't play right. Oh, oh, it's playing, but no sound. Um, so ultimately, what we have here is um, Recycle Bank is seen by communities as a way to help. Uh, reach its sustainability goals. So um, are there any New Yorkers in the room or native New Yorkers in the room? So would you like to garner a guess where your trash goes uh, when you're living in New York or when it's picked up in New York? Uh -huh. Texas. Staten Island used to. So uh, currently it's being transported to both Pennsylvania and Ohio. So you can imagine both the, the sustainable impact or the environmental impact that that transportation has, but also all the costs that are involved in that transportation, as well as the addition of landfill, fee landfill fees. So it behooves communities really to look for cost savings in terms of being able to divert uh, recyclables from the waste stream means that less waste is going into the landfill and thereby decreasing their landfill fees, but also there's the opportunity to uh, generate revenue from the commodities. There is a commodities market for paper, glass, uh, plastics, um, and in which they are able to really capitalize on and, and bring revenue to their bottom line. Uh, this is a picture of um, a launch in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Uh, in particular, you see um, us really starting to make headway um, as it relates to uh, areas in the southeast uh, and the southwest, particularly in the mindset of really being able to impact their bottom lines. Um, here we have the mayor in her, in her glorious red jacket. Uh, she had pearls and diamonds on in that day. And we actually, this was our launch event, and we, there was, we went in and we actually opened up bags of trash as an example to show how much is actually not getting diverted 
uh, into recyclables. And we pulled out cans of aluminum, we pulled out plastic bottles, there was paper cardboard in there. It was amazing to, think, to see how much just in these three, four random bags of trash that we had, uh, you know, how much was still really in there. And ultimately, Fort Worth estimates that they are, you know, they currently could be saving uh, $13 million uh, per year uh, just on the commodities um, themselves. And so this is, you know, a new rollout in which, uh, you know, we've begun a, a strong partnership with them. But to that end, uh, communities really see um, us being able to be their marketing platform. Um, ultimately, they have the infrastructure, uh, the communities have the infrastructure for uh, picking up the recycling, and then they overlay Recycle Bank in which to be able to communicate with their residents. So many times we go into meetings and we talk about you know, ways that we can partner with each other, and the community, the community council members very much acknowledge the, uh, you know, that they need to have, uh, be communicating with their residents where they are. So whether it be on Facebook or Twitter, um, or other um, outlet, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, online channels. And really, they're just not capable at this point in time to put the resources to that. So they really see us being able to overlay our marketing expertise uh, through our email channel, uh, through our, through our um, on the ground activation events, um, as well as our online and social media outlets to be able to, one, get the word out about the program, but also um, to be able to get the knowledge about, about what is actually recyclable in their local uh, communities. That is the number one ask uh, that we get from members, is really this understanding of what, when, where is recyclable in my community, and we are seen as that um, outlet and communication channel uh, in which to do that. So now sort of to the crux of the presentation um, and why we're here today to talk about how do we drive um, online lives uh, through to offline behavior? Um, and really at our core, the tactic that we use is called gamification. Um, and what this essentially means is we're using gaming tactics such as point-based point -based currency or leveling, leaderboards, um, surprises when, you know, surprise and delight when you're not expecting it. Um, in a non-gaming environment. Uh, this is not something new uh, you, to uh, the world of um, marketing. Loyalty-based uh, incentives have been around for a long time. If you think about the airline industry and frequent flyer programs, or the credit card industry and cash back, you know, it's a mechanism in which we look to engage participation, to garner loyalty, um, and also to create that you know, brand affinity and emotional connection to want to have that personal tie and to keep coming back and to, re and to keep engaging with your product and services. I wanted to sort of, you know, provide a bit of a, a, a context in which uh, gamification lives. So um, really what has driven gamification over the course of the last, say, five to seven years really has been technology and your mobile phone and smartphones. Um, you know, this has really driven it to a whole other level. Um, here are just a handful of examples of those that I consider best in class um, in terms of using gamification tactics. To me, Foursquare was really the, um, you know, the purveyor of uh, gamification tactics. You know, the idea of checking into a place, getting points for checking into the place, getting that feedback loop of, this is the first time you've checked into Yale University. Um, you know, this is the, you know, be the first of your friends to check into this place. Um, and, you know, really bring gamification principles and tactics um, in the mobile uh, location space. Nike Plus, really a thought leader and disruptive in the apparel and fitness. So really bringing that feedback mechanism, how many miles you have run, how many calories, what does that look like in comparison to your peers? Um, how is your, you know, your newest PR, how is that compared to your peers? And also setting goals for yourself, whether you want to run a half marathon or marathon and helping you get there. Starbucks, Starbucks rewards really have made it so seamless 
um, and turn key. And really, I think about this all the time in terms of I never really have to think about um, where's that piece of paper or that you know, making sure that the, the counter person stamped it right and that you will see and then keeping count of how many coffees I've got so I get my next free coffee. Really, Starbucks has made it so turnkey and easy through their mobile app. Um, and you know, they're constantly talking to me, constantly knowing like my, my favorite drink is a low-fat cappuccino, tall low-fat cappuccino, and making sure that, you know, that, that you know, when I don't order it, what, what's up? Why did I decide to do that? And lastly, I put up the example of Vigil. So all these uh, in their day have been disruptors within their, within their industry or vertical. And Vigil is a, a newly launched uh, app in which, um, in a place where you wouldn't necessarily think you would need a loyalty scheme. And really, that's in TV. So TV itself is going through a transformation. Uh, viewership is down. People are just getting content where they want to get it. And Vigil has come up with a rewards uh, scheme using gamification in which you check into the show that you watch. You get points for the show. You get certain points. You get certain points for certain shows. And they also have a live aspect in which you can play games and answer questions and get more points. And then you can de redeem those points for rewards to uh, national and local retailers. So these are just a couple of examples. And really, how RecycleBank fits in there is really doing it in terms of the sustainability world. So our platform, uh, it's you know, threefold. It consists of a community. They can be your friends. They can be your neighbors. And they can also be people that are like-minded, share the values that you share. Content, uh, the content varies. We have a, um, you know, a range of spectrum of depth from daily tips, whether it be on Facebook or on RecycleBank.com, to just sort of easily incorporate and remember that quick reminder uh, of if you're shopping for the most recent one was floors. You know, make sure that you're thinking about sustainable sourced. Uh, you know, if you're doing wood floors, sustainable sourced uh, wood floors. To um, two to three minute interactive educational modules. Um, currently, we have the uh, a module up that is uh, for Earth Month. And it's based on a time capsule. Um, and so you know, it's about uh, delivering the content in an engaging, relevant manner. Uh, the 80s, uh, 80s module just came up, and I was taking it yesterday. And uh, you know, one of the ways in which we uh, make it memorable and digestible is we had a, a quick tip on, or it was take a pledge, based on the launch of Diet Coke. And really, the educational element was really to get across that aluminum is infinitely recyclable and to always remember that so that you remember that you uh, recycle that you recycle your aluminum can. But the association of the launch of the Diet Coke and really outplacing TAB in the early 80s uh, was monumental. So that association to sort of make it relevant in my mind and kind of remember when Diet Coke came out, uh, for those of us that remember the 80s. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and then also that reminder to, you know, recycle my aluminum cans. So then the commerce platform. Um, and this really is our rewards marketplace. Uh, you know, we have over 3,000 uh, local and national retailers in which we partner with. Um, and you know, deals and discounts, all the way from uh, Bed Bath & Beyond uh, to the local pizza shop uh, down, from, down from the corner. And really, what we see is in this, in this uh, trifecta, we're able to overlay gaming tactics on top of that and able to really be able to move someone down their journey. And as we have developed this, one of the key things that has really come across is that brands are also looking to get across their sustainability messaging. So this was the time for another video, but I will um, do the voiceover essentially. So uh, many marketing brands um, in this day and age are really trying to figure out the sustainability world as well. Um, they have worked very diligently on their, um, on their supply chains to make it more sustainable, um, many of their manufacturing or infrastructure. But there's only so much they can actually do when it's actually the consumer that has the greatest impact. And so they see us as being able to leverage our platform to be able to get out their sustainability messaging, um, really be able to connect with consumers, to in an authentic and uh, an authentic way and an engaging way through our gaming tactics, uh, to be able to get their message across. Um, first, really increase awareness, but then also create that emotional connection with 
brand affinity, that someone is along this journey with me just as, you know, as I'm going through it, as we realize that no one is perfect, um, and ultimately to deciding uh, to purchase intent for, you know, at shelf, making the decision for um, a more sustainable, greener product. Sorry. So one of the key uh, partners that we have um, is SC Johnson. And essentially, you know, they um, have an overarching corporate goal in which they're looking to be uh, landfill neutral. And so they saw this, our platform, as a way to be able to engage on a, on a mass scale uh, to be able to help uh, uh, fulfill this goal. And so we set out last year, the end of la or second half of last year, and came up with the recycling challenge. Um, we uh, went out into 50 communities, 50 individual communities, so now, so we were in every state, um, and it was a competition in which uh, com uh, communities uh, competed um, to increase their recycling. Um, and the highest participation ultimately won uh, the recycling competition. And the prize at the end of the day was a $100,000 grant for um, community sustainability project. So as I mentioned, we launched this last year. It ran over the course of six months through December. Um, and we just were able to recently announce, um, oops, announce our winner, um, in which was a community in Red, Wa Red Rocks, uh, Virginia. Um, and what is, um, what, is what is very heartening about the whole project is one, you're getting out the awareness um, to increase recycling, and there was a huge amount of participation. Ultimately, one of the goals was being able to see if we we're able to have sustained behavior change over time. Uh, the tactics that we employed were both the on-the-ground uh, launching of the campaign, but we also had this online aspect, um, which every month there was a leaderboard that got updated, um, and there was a house in which um, you could learn how to be greener in each one of the different rooms. And every month, a new room opened up. And we saw the sustained engagement over the course of the six months as people came back to not only report their recycling, but also learn how to be greener. And not only did we see this increased awareness for SCJ and the, their sustainability initiatives, but we also saw the inter overlay of that uh, people who engaged with the module were also more likely to then go order the rewards that SEG, of the SAJ products. So it was sort of it was a win-win situation, uh, both uh, for, for everyone involved, because not only did we increase the awareness and increase uh, participation and engagement, uh, there was also the play of um, purchase intent as well. Um, so you're probably asking yourself, what is Red Rocks uh, of Virginia going to, to, to do with their $100,000 grant? Um, ultimately, they have a community center uh, in their community, and they are going to be um, using it towards solar, so, solar panels uh, to help uh, provide energy for that community center. So last but definitely not least, uh, and something that I think about uh, almost all of my time, is our members. Um, ultimately, uh, what we're able to show um, and our goal is to really motivate the offline behavior. Um, and ultimately, you know, as it says, amplify um, consciousness through our education and incentives. Skip the video. And ultimately, we've seen success um, in changing recycling behavior, both from uh, actual lifts in, in recycling. So on average, when we have no infrastructure changes, so nothing changes in the it just recycle bank rolls out into the community, we have an average lift of 5 to 15% uh, lift in recycling for that community. Um, while uh, you know, this may not seem overwhelmingly, at the end of the day, what this, the impact that this has on the bottom line and uh, for these communities is, is, uh, is quite significant. Also, we have overlaid on that what, consume, what members say. Um, and 82% report that since RecycleBank uh, has launched, it's been influential to recycling them more. So we both have the actual uh, actual behavior as well as the stated behavior. 
Beyond that, um, we actually have proven results beyond recycling. So as I mentioned uh, from the upfront, ultimately our goal is to drive uh, for you know, greener actions in their life. And you know, through our engagement, our educational elements, uh, we, beyond recycling, we see that we're able to really begin to bring members down the, that path uh, to a greener lifestyle. So 80% um, report that RecycleBank has been influential in encouraging them to take other green actions. And 70 cent report that RecycleBank has provided them with good information to be more eco-friendly. And what we have seen is over the course of a year within our program is members incorporating one more green action into their life. Um, we track members uh, pretty closely um, from entry into the program through their entire life cycle. Um, and it's just amazing to see the impact that the, the education and the incentive base um, and the taxes that we're using have to drive them down their journey. So brands themselves, marketing brands, also are interested in driving down this path of sustainability. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about an example from Suave. So Unilever is another one of our uh, marketing partners um, and have, has sustainability goals um, as well. And ultimately, they were really looking to uh, you know, get their feet wet I guess pun intended, um, uh, as, it relates to, as it relates to the topic of water. And so we came up with their campaign uh, for Turn Off the Tap. Uh, we, it was a dual uh, way of which you could pledge. One was you could pledge to uh, take a two-minute shorter shower, uh, and the other pledge was to turn off the tap while you lather. Uh, the ways that you could engage um, and uh, you know, participate was there was a quiz, uh, in which there was the learning element, and pretty much the primary message that was driven was about the economic savings of turning off the water. Uh, you know, Suave felt, um, and the, from the research that we had at the time, we felt that that would be the primary uh, driver in terms of wanting to save water. So uh, ultimately, actually, what the results, le results showed was we did, we did some follow-up uh, with members who had taken the pledge, um, to really ask them, one, had they, take, you know, had they taken the pledge, and then two, if they had, you know, uh, you know why, and if they hadn't, why not? Um, of the two pledges, we ultimately saw that taking a shorter shower was overwhelmingly uh, a lot easier to incorporate into their lives. Um, pretty much they said that it was easy for them to remember to, for, for them to remember to do. Turning off the tap, a little bit more disruptive into the whole process of taking a shower, and thus less likely to be incorporated, uh, incorporated into, into their daily habits. But what was most interesting is really when we started to ask those people who actually hadn't taken uh, the, you know, who had taken the pledge, but didn't, didn't start taking the action, why hadn't they started? And overwhelmingly in both instances, it really was that time factor. It was that they didn't remember. There was that, there was that no, um, you know, uh, sort of signal to remember to do that. And so ultimately what we saw uh, this happen is it really led to innovation for um, Unilever and Suave in particular. They brought this back to the drawing board and really over the course of the last year have really brought markets or products to market to really address this. So um, one, what they did was they, um, along with Suave products for a limited time, they, had, they included a timer. It was called the Water Pebble, um, and it was out in Walmart uh, for a limited time. And really, you know, be able to have something that was tangible to remember to, um, you know, put your timer on for, for your um, shower. Secondly, they developed a line, a two-in-one uh, shampoo line for adults that was particularly targeted um, for men, and it was a new launch product for men. And hope, and you know, that was to help, you know, so they didn't have to remember to do it, but that just that time savings would ultimately impact water conservation. Um, and last but not least, they also introduced dry shampoo into their, into their line, um, and really helping to just um, continually, without, you know, messaging of looking to save money wasn't going to resonate, so looking for other alternatives and innovations in which they could uh, still drive towards that goal of 
conserving water, but in new, and, uh, in new ways. So ultimately, um, you know, in the 21st century, we're really faced with uh, 20, you know, 21st century problems really need 21st century movements. Um, and where we see that is really the intersect of you know, technology and social really being able to drive that. At our core, uh, we believe that you know, every little step counts. It's just you know, being able to make, that, uh, make your journey down that path. Um, and every little um, action uh, will actually have a collective a greater impact. Um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Is there a mic? Thank you for your talk, it's very enlightening. Um, I have a question regarding the, at the very beginning of your pre presentation about the data and how much, uh, what's the percentage of the items are recycled. So I was wondering, so for, for, the, for the thing I put in the recycle bin, how much is it is actually being recycled? So 18% of materials I, are being recycled, but of the 100% that could be recycled. So for, the, so for all the, Recycled like bottles that I throw into the recycle bin, like outside, 18% of that stuff is recycled. No, no, no. no. Or? So it's the consumer. So in the household, of the total amount that you could recycle, only 18% is actually getting recycled. So the large majority is still ending up in the waste bin. Are you saying 18% of the uh, the stuff that can be recycled is actually recycled, or? Uh, because my question is all, all about if I have actually put things in the recycle bin mm -hmm. and the stuff was transported to the recycle facilities, Yeah, is that everything in the recycle facility will be recycled or are there are still lots of things kind of just hanging around in their inventory because of the lack of, fa lack of facility capacity to recycle everything they receive? Sure. So, yeah. So everything, I mean, it's very municipality, community dependent. Um, that's why some places take plastic number fives and some don't. So everything that is being collected uh, through the recycling stream uh, that is brought to the MRF would get recycled. Typically, it's sold on a secondary market as the commodity market um, and, uh, and it gets recycled. Do you talk about recycling textiles at all? Sure. So yeah, actually, well, I was just going through some of our daily um, uh, daily tips, and we had a daily tip um, in the last week just on uh, how to go about recycling uh, textiles. You know, it's not something uh, in particular that um, you know it's sort of up and coming. So I know in New York City, um, it has been a recent uh, uh, addition into in which we can do it. The, we, it's not something that we can do within our households. We actually have to bring it to certain, area, certain uh, areas that take it, such as the farmer's market. Um, but we, we do begin to address it uh, in a very broad-reaching way um, and then be able to forward people on to uh, local information in which they would be able to, to do it. Great. Thank you. Um, over here. Oh. Uh, do you do anything to uh, verify the self-reported claims of the consumers, say measure the, the, um, the water consumption or measure the waste generation um, sure. to get beyond the self-reported surveys? Yeah, um, so absolutely. So, um, I mean, that's a lot of the research that I um, have a foundation in. So we, um, what we have seen through our research um, both from, because uh, we do have non-self-reported products as well, is that uh, people report when they recycle. Um, there is very uh, little um, gaming or, or gaming of the system or not doing it when you don't do it. it seems to be a very inherent uh, behavior. Um, and I think what really the success about that is, is that you are attaching it to a behavior that's already happening. So. Uh, you go and you put your bin on the curbside um, or you're putting it out wherever you need to put it out, you think to go then report. 
Um, so we see very little um, uh, difference between when we actually know the pickup is and the amount of times people self-report. The answer could be yes, even if they don't do it every time. Or do you uh, put the stuff out at the, at the curb? Well, um, how much of the recyclable material are they actually capturing in the recycling effort? Right. So uh, yes. So we can't guarantee that it's every time. Uh, however, um, I mean, the it's about the journey. So even if you do it one last time or not as frequently as you or as more frequently than you had before. Um, it's, you know, it's about a process. Uh, nice talk, Marta. Uh Two questions. One is, is all of your statistics based on self-reporting, or are you looking at the whole landfill percentages for a community? No, so um, uh, the majority of our um, reporting is actually uh, actual. So we, when we work with um, uh, communities, they will provide a baseline recycling rate uh, that they have. And then we actually, the way that we can give, the way that we give points is when we, know, we get the recycling weight based on the community. So um, we have that data, and thus we can look at the delta between before and after. Um, the, the member perceived or self-reported is sort of a complementary to that. Um, but we rely heavily, solely, heavily on the, the actual the weight data. Um, second question is the 5 to 15% lift that you um, put on the slide. Mm -hmm. Have you gone back um, to any communities to see a year later, two years later, to see how sticky that is? Um, sure. So, I mean, Recycle Bank uh, was launched initially in 2006. So we actually have eight, eight seven years of data uh, going back. And so it's an average over that period of time. That's not uh, over that period of time. It inc incorporates that. Anything else? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, so um, I guess that will be a 15 minute break, and we'll join up here again at 1130 for a presentation by Josh Dorfman of Vine.com. Thank you all. <laughs>